There's this old preacher way back in the day. His name was G.W. Ravensbury. And his whole thing is he would get on a train and he would ride it from town to town to town, just kind of preaching the gospel as he went. And he has a lot of stories that he collected over the years, as you might imagine. But my favorite one that he tells is this time he was on a train and there's this young man on there, just a real nervous guy, just kind of like pacing back and forth. And he'd stop and he'd stare out the window and he'd pace a little bit more and then he'd stare out the window again. Like, like there's obviously something on this guy's mind. And so Ravensbury, he scoots over to the seat next to this guy, introduces himself, and he says, son, is there something that you, you want to talk about? And this kid opens his mouth, and like his life story just starts to fall out. He said, when I was younger, my dad and I, we never really got along. Like we would fight about everything, and then we would fight about nothing, and we were just always at each other's throats. And there was one time in particular where we were really at it, and I said something like, well, why don't I just leave? My dad pointed. He said, there's the door. And so I went upstairs, and I threw all my stuff in a suitcase. And when I came down, he said, if you walk out that door, don't you ever come back. But I just kept walking. So I traveled around for a little while, and life wasn't real kind to me. I tried to find work, but I never really landed much. I was out drinking with some buddies one night, had too much, and we ended up robbing a liquor store. We got caught, and I did a stretch in prison. And while I was in there, I wrote a letter home explaining to my parents what had happened and where I was and how much I missed them. And then I said in that letter, you know, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be passing through. And if you want to see me, if, if it's okay for me to come in, just tie something white in the tree out front. My, my house is right off the tracks. But he said, if I don't see anything, I won't bother you. That's how the letter ended, and that's how his story ended. And, and after a couple of minutes of just silence, he said, preacher, if there's not something white in that tree, I don't know what I'm going to do, because I'm at the end of my rope. He was afraid to go home. And maybe that's a story that some of us in here can resonate with. You know, maybe you have had, or maybe you're right now, you're in a moment where you want to go home, so to speak, but you feel like there's something standing in the way. There's some fear, some, some apprehension, something. I had one of those moments when I was 17, I got my first speeding ticket. I was driving way too fast in the rain. I deserved it. But I had my eight-year-old sister in the car with me. And she was at that age where, like, she couldn't keep a secret, and she didn't know what mom did and did not need to know. And so I was pretty sure she was going to find out about it anyway. So I thought, this is best come from me. So we pulled into the driveway, and I just sat in my car for, like, 10 minutes. And part of me wanted to go in. Like, I, I wanted to just get it over with. But then there was another part of me that just was stuck, because I knew there were going to be consequences to pay that I didn't want to have to deal with. There was like this fear and this apprehension. And, and I was in that moment where like I wanted to go home, this time literally, but I couldn't. I think we've all had a moment like that before. And that's why we're starting this series this week. It's a brand new four-part series. It's called It's Never Too Late. You know, we all have something in our life that makes us feel like it's too late sometimes. Like maybe you had this argument with somebody They got way too heated. Maybe you said some things that you didn't mean. Or maybe there was a choice in your life, like this decisive moment that just totally would have put you on a different path. But you messed up, or or you said the wrong thing, or you did the wrong thing, and you wish you could go back and change it, but you can't. This is just how life is now. It's too late. That's what we tell ourselves a lot of time. But what if that's not true? What if it's not too late? I mean, like, obviously we can't go back in time and undo the past, but, but that doesn't mean we just have to leave things lie the way they are either. There's this theme that runs throughout the Bible, and it's going to tie the next four weeks together. It's this theme that when God gets involved in our lives, it's never, capital N-E-V-E-R, never too late. But what if you're kind of on the outs with God? Like, what if you've had a falling out? That, that's a, an important question here. Like, what if you walked away from him at some point in your life, or or maybe you haven't really talked to God in a while, or maybe you think there's something you you did, something that happened in your life, you're not even sure if God wants you to come home. What do you do then? Is it too late? That's what we're starting off with this morning. And to guide us in this conversation, we're going to be looking at a story that Jesus tells us in the book of Luke. It's in chapter 15. So if you have your Bible with you, I want to encourage you to open that up and follow along with us. But if you don't have a physical Bible with you, don't sweat it. We put the passages on the screens for you to follow along. But something even better than that, on your mobile device, you can download the YouVersion Bible app. It's 
the Y-O-U version. It's free. You'll have a Bible with you all the time. There are weekly devotionals you can select from. It's a pretty amazing tool. So I want to encourage you to download that and follow along there. Luke chapter 15 is where we're going to start. Now this story this morning is going to seem familiar to some of us for different reasons. Some of us have heard it before, and some of us have lived it before. And some of us are living it right now. It's the story of a son who thought it was too late to come home. And it starts off like this in verse 11. It says, Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so he divided his property between them. And we're going to pause there for a minute because there's a little bit of explanation that we need in order to, to really appreciate what's happening here. So this father has two sons, and the youngest one comes to him one day and he says, Dad, I'd like my inheritance now. Now, an inheritance, as you know, is something you receive typically after your parents have passed away, but obviously his dad is still very much alive, presumably in good health. We don't have any inclination otherwise. So it's kind of odd that this son comes and asks for his inheritance. It's not totally unheard of today to get that early, but in this particular culture, this was a first century Jewish culture, this was the equivalent of basically saying, I wish you would hurry up and die so I could just get my money already. Like, this is the kind of thing that's going to make Thanksgiving dinner really awkward this year, okay? This is not a good thing that's happened. And for whatever reason, we're not told, but this father complies. Now, under any other circumstance, this father would have put his son in place, and I don't know what would happen. But this dad, maybe he's just too heartbroken to argue, we're not told. But he gives his son the money. The story picks up, verse 13. So it's not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. And after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So this young son, he gets all this money, goes off to the city, and just blows through it with lightning speed and veracity. And it all runs out, just in time for a huge recession to hit the economy. This famine comes in, food is scarce, prices go through the roof, and this kid can't even afford enough to, like, survive. And so he hires himself out to a hog farmer. And that might not seem too weird to us, but in this particular context, it was weird. And we need to appreciate this, too, because in our culture, we love pork, right? Like, bacon is proof that God is good. Amen? I got a better response from that than I have like preaching my heart out about Jesus and salvation. Okay, we love pork in our culture. And in our local economy in particular, that love of pork is significant, right? Because we have that processing plant. So we, we probably need to pause especially and understand this. This first century Jewish culture did not share our affinity for pork. Like pork was an unclean substance. Hogs were unclean animals. And not just like dirty Anybody that's been outside of Smithfield on hog day knows that the pigs are dirty. Like they were ceremonially unclean. Meaning that if I were to come into contact with a pig, I wouldn't be able to go to temple. I wouldn't be able to set foot in God's presence or in the community of God's people. Like I was just separated until that, that uncleanness was, was taken care of somehow. So this Jewish young man who we're talking about, he would have spent his whole life up to this moment avoiding pigs. But there's something about desperation that will make you do things you never thought you'd do. Like when your back is against the wall, you'll do whatever you have to. Case in point, where I went to college in Joplin, Missouri, there was this clinic where you could donate plasma. And I wasn't a big fan of it, but it was easy money because you'd walk in, 30 minutes later, you'd walk out with 25 bucks in your hand, and you could do this twice a week. And for the really loyal donors, if you hit every appointment that month, there was a bonus on top of that. So this isn't like an inconsequential amount of money for a college kid. But I wasn't really a fan. Because what they do, they'd sit you in this chair and they'd put a needle in your arm. I'm not a huge fan of needles. And they'd take your blood and they'd put it in this machine and it would just swirl it around to separate the plasma from your blood. Again, not right, but that's okay. And then they would mix that leftover blood with like this electrolyte formula so that you would produce more plasma. And then they put it back in your body, y'all. Like... And this was the weird part. That blood had cooled down to room temperature, so there was this icy sensation you could feel that would move across your arm, into your chest, and like you could feel it in your heart. Ugh, like it was just bad. So I didn't, I didn't give plasma. But there were times 
where that broke college kid stereotype fit me like a glove. And when I was desperate enough and hungry enough, I'd walk in that clinic like, let's do this. You know, I need to eat today. When you're desperate, you do as you have to. And that's where this guy is. He has hit rock bottom. It says that he longs to eat the pods that are in the hog trough. And these are not like green beans and snow peas, okay? This was like those honey locust pods that fall around here. It's like that. They're really tough and fibrous and bitter. Don't ask me how I know they're bitter. They just are. Like, this was not a good thing. I mean, here's the thing with, with parables that Jesus tells us, okay? More often than not, we find ourselves in the characters. And this one is no exception. We all, at one time or another, somehow, some way, we have all been this runaway son. I mean, you just think about your life for a minute. We have this God who loves us. He's crazy about us. He has blessed our lives with so much good. And how do we respond to him? A lot of times we reject that love. We, we choose to go our own way, to walk our own path. God, I know what you, you said, but I'm, I'm going to do it a different way. Thanks anyway. We reject him. I mean, one of the earliest stories in the Bible, Genesis chapter 2, it's a story about rejecting God. We didn't make it two chapters, okay? Two chapters before we reject him. You look at the end of Genesis chapter 2, it ends pretty good. Like Adam's got a relationship with God, which is good. He's got a home, which is good. He's got a job. Things are going pretty well there. That's good. He's got this smoking hot wife, and we know that they both had rock and bods because the last words in that chapter are, they were naked and felt no shame. Doesn't matter how you slice it, folks. Things are coming up aces for Adam. And how does he respond to that? He rejects God. He says, I'm going to do things my way, the way I think they need to be done. No thank you, sir. And what happens? Chaos invades. And his life starts to unravel. And by the time we get to the end of chapter 3, that relationship with God has been trashed. He gets kicked out of his home. His job gets a thousand times harder. And that marriage that seems so awesome, well, conflict has invaded that. Anybody that's experienced marital conflict can say, thank you, Adam. We really appreciate your contribution to society. Life comes unraveled. It's what happened to Adam. It's what happened to this runaway son. It's what happens to us. This kid named Eric Searcy, he's a baseball player. He graduated from high school, and he signed to go play ball with the University of Louisiana. But before he signed with the school, the coach sat him down as he sat down all the other players, and he explained very clearly, anybody that plays for me, I have a very high standard, not just on the field, but off the field too. There is a curfew. You will do this. You will not do that. You will maintain this grade point average. Like, there were rules in place. Eric heard all of them, and he signed on the line. But that fall, he suffered a rotator cuff injury, landed him on the practice squad that season. And Eric convinced himself, I'm just on the practice squad. So like the rules, they don't, they don't really apply so much to me. I mean, I'm not even going to be on the field most of the time. So when his friends invited him to go out to a party one night after curfew, Eric said, sure thing. And on the way back home, they were hit by a drunk driver. And Eric woke up in a hospital bed, paralyzed from the neck down. His whole life came unraveled. Because in his own words, I wasn't doing what the coach told me to do. How many times in our life do things come unraveled, not because of somebody else, not because of bad luck, but because of a choice or a decision that we made, because we said to the coach, no thanks, I'm going to go my own way, my own path, and life started to unravel. It happens all the time. And when we experience this, we find ourselves in this place where we want to come home. We want to do things over. We want to start fresh. But the question is, can we? Or is it too late to come home? That's the question that this young man asked himself. And then one day he came to a realization. Look at verse 17. It says, When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And so he got up and he went to his father. So the son hits rock bottom and it's like he hits the wall and that's his wake up call. Things cannot get worse. And here I'm, I'm sitting here starving to death. My father's servants, his slaves, they got full bellies. 
what am I doing? Like, he's going to go home, and he's going to get, you know, eat, and things are going to be better. But here's the thing. He's not an idiot. Like, he knows what he's done, and he knows what he said, and he knows that none of this can be undone. So he doesn't intend to go home as a son. He intends to go home as a slave. Because better a slave with a full belly than a free man who's starving to death. And so he picks up and he goes. Sometimes when life starts to unravel, like we have to hit that wall and come to our senses like this kid. You know, I'm sure you've had those moments before where you finally hit the bottom and say, something's got to change. I can't keep living an unraveled life. Mine came kind of early in college. I, I used to be a really competitive person and I wasn't the best at keeping my emotions in check. And so we were in the gym, I was playing ball with some guys, and it was just a friendly game. But I was, you know, Jordan's got to win because that was my dumb thing. And so we, we were playing. I made a bad call. I was a little arrogant, a little cocky, and it ended up costing us the game. And I was so mad, not at anybody else. I was mad at myself for making that decision. There was this big support beam for the gym right there. It was like this, you know, foot and a half by foot and a half wood pillar, and it had a quarter inch of padding on it. And I just hauled off and I punched it because I thought, it's got a pad. What's the worst that could happen? I broke two bones in my hand, and it hurt a lot. And that was my wake-up call. I can't keep doing this. Like, I, I got to get this under control. I can't keep living this unraveled life where I just let my anger get the best of me. Maybe you've had that moment. You hit the bottom. You said, I can't keep doing this. I need to change. But is it too late? That's where the rest of the story comes in. Because this isn't just a story about a son who thought it was too late to come home. There's always two sides to every story. This one's no different. This is also the story of a heartbroken father. And listen to his response to this runaway son. Pick it up in verse 20. It says, But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, put sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf, which was like a, a fancy bottle of champagne back in this culture. Get the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. The son is coming down the road, and, and his dad sees him, runs out to meet him. And this son, you know, remember, he had this whole apology speech that he had worked up. You read that a couple of verses earlier. And by the time he gets there, he starts to launch into this speech. He doesn't get halfway through before his dad interrupts and gives him the answer. No, you will not come back into this household as a servant because you never stop being my son. He says, go get a robe. And robes, they weren't like common. You didn't give robes to just anybody. You gave robes to important people. And he says, go get a ring. And this was like the signet ring with the family crest on it. He didn't give that to servants. You gave that to sons. In every way, this father, he welcomes his son back into the family because it wasn't too late to come home. It's a beautiful picture. But here's the part that stands out most to me. It's in verse 20. It says, while he was still a long way off, this father ran out to meet him. Remember, this is a first century Jewish culture, okay? And in that culture, men did not run. It was embarrassing. It, it was disgraceful. It was undignified. Men carried themselves tall and they walked. But when this father sees his son coming down the road, he just doesn't care. He throws caution to the wind and he's willing to disgrace himself just to make sure this son knows He's welcome home. G.W. Ravensbury was on this train, and about an hour after the young man finished his story, he perked his head up and said, my house is just around this next bend. And the kid was too nervous to get up and look, and so Ravensbury, he was the one at the window, just like pushing his face up against the glass, and he was hoping, praying to see anything, just, just anything white hanging up in that tree. And he writes, what I saw next was the most beautiful thing my eyes had ever beheld. Hanging in that tree was every sheet, every pillowcase, 
every towel, every washcloth, every t-shirt, every piece of underwear, every piece of white fabric that that family owned was hanging up in that tree, welcoming this son home. And when the kid saw it, he ran off the train, and he was met by this old man bursting out the front door, running out to meet him and wrap him up in his arms. Because it wasn't too late to come home. And that's kind of how God is. We ask this question, is it too late to come back to him? Is it too late to start over? Is it too late to come home? And I would say no. If Jesus is to be believed, God's like a father. He's not like this father who holds a grudge, and he's not like this father who keeps digging up the past. He's, he's that I just want you to come home, Father. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how far off you've wandered. I don't care where you've been. I don't care how long it's been. I just want you to come home. That's who our God is. But he didn't hang a bunch of linens in a tree to let you know that. He hung his son on a tree. Jesus Christ came into this world and he was nailed to a cross and he died there. And alongside him, all of our sins, all of our shortcomings, all of our rejections, all those times where we said, no thanks God, I'll do it my own way, every single one of those was nailed there and died right along with him. Jesus has cleared this path and this road back to God. Every obstacle has been removed. And today, God just sits and waits staring down that road, hoping and praying to catch a glimpse of you and me coming down so he can run out to meet us. Because, gang, it is never too late to come home. Some of us today need to hear that. We're going to sing a song in a minute. And I'm going to be in the back of the room. Maybe you've been, a long, been gone a long time. Maybe, maybe you've just now you're starting to believe that this God wants you and wants to love you and know you. Whatever your case may be, if you need to come home, make that decision and that step today. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your love and your patience and your grace. I just look at my own life and I know that there are a thousand times where I have strayed and faltered and failed and fallen short and wandered And I'm so thankful for Jesus and what he's done. For the grace and the second chances that come through him. And this truth that it's never too late to come home. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.